Hello and welcome to this presentation on the Medical Cannabis Provider Education for the State of Delaware. My name is Jehan Marku and just to disclose my conflict of interest, I have received uh, travel fees in the past to give talks on pharmacogenomics and medical cannabis. The other planners of this presentation, Carol Latte, Paul Hyland, and Alexa Meinhardt, have no conflicts of interest or disclosures to report. For this continuing medical education presentation, the Medical Society of Delaware designates this activity for a maximum of one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Physicians should claim only the credit commensurate with their extent of participation in the activity. After this course, you should be able to recognize the policies and procedures of the medical marijuana program in Delaware, including how a physician in Delaware can certify a patient for a qualifying medical condition. You should be able to describe the biological, chemical, and physiological processes of cannabis in the human body. You should also be able to identify formulations, adverse events, contraindications, and dose-response relationships of medical cannabis. The primary goal of the medical marijuana program in Delaware is to help patients to ensure that these Delawareans receive the best available information about medical cannabis, and also to connect them to Delaware's medical community to encourage the continuity of care, fill in gaps in knowledge, and inform evidence-based practice. As we go through this presentation, we will talk a lot about research, and we need to cover association and causation, because due to the lack of research that is approved in the United States because of the scheduling status of cannabis, there are largely observational, analytical, and observational descriptive designs for cannabis in the United States. The most powerful form of evidence are systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and randomized controlled trials. However, due to the Schedule I status of cannabis or marijuana, as we'll discuss later, these types of studies are limited. And as we hear in the news, in media, and studies, cannabis is associated with a lot of things, a lot of health effects and a lot of negative health effects. Um, but many of these events are associations. So event A and B can be linked to each other, but it does not mean they are causative. Many sources regarding cannabis, whether good or bad, confuse this association with causation. Correlation is not causality. We should remember this as we go through this literature. Cannabis is a factor in many conditions. It can be a good factor or it can be a bad factor. The current holy grail of medical cannabis is the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's 2017 report, The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, The Current State of Evidence and Recommendations for Research. This is a free publication available in PDF form the entire report is about 400 pages and reviews over 10,000 research articles on the effects of cannabis on health. A bullet-pointed summary of the report by the authors is also available. This is limited to research prior to 2017, so many of the newer clinical studies, such as on CBD and anxiety and other more modern clinical trial designs, are not included in this publication. But there have been a lot of advancements since the last version of this was published 20 years ago. This publication was written by world-renowned experts in science and medicine, as well as in cannabinoid research. And it forms the basis for how Delaware structures their program in terms of what qualifying conditions are allowed in the state for medical cannabis. Cannabis has a rich history in the world. It is one of the oldest cultivated plants known to man. The hemp plant is cannabis. Cannabis is hemp, but they are cultivated for different purposes. The hemp plant is typically cultivated for textiles, for clothing, for paper, for even making concrete. Um, it's been used to make bows and arrows in ancient times. But again, it's associated with food, oil, clothing, and textiles. It also has a rich history in medical applications. The oldest and most complete medical pharmacopoeia 
is from the Emperor Sheng Nung, who tried and experimented with hundreds of plants and is also known as the father of modern agriculture, uh, recorded medical uses of cannabis. Hemp in North America also has a rich tradition on both the East Coast and the West Coast. In the East Coast, it was used in the colonies. Virginia passed a law requiring all farmers to grow it. Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia used hemp as currency. While on the West Coast, the Spanish missionaries planted hemp farms with every mission that they set up. One of those missions uh, is still exists without the hemp farm in San Francisco. Cannabis in the United States is federally illegal. As we'll go into detail on the next slide, it is a Schedule I drug, which means it has no accepted medical value and a high potential for abuse. The federal government does not differentiate between medical and recreational cannabis. The federal government regulates its drugs through the Controlled Substances Act. As you can see from the animated graphic below, several states have legalized cannabis for different purposes. 34 states have legalized cannabis in some form as a medical product. 12 states have limited access laws to low THC, high CBD products. And we will get into the differences in formulation and activities of these products later on. Cannabis is fully legal for adult use in 11 states presently. Here is the, what the current map looks like in terms of adult use programs, uh, comprehensive medical programs. The only states that don't have any type of cannabis program are exactly where you'd expect them to be. So regarding drug scheduling and approved products, the DEA maintains the scheduling status of drugs in categories one through five. Schedule one is where you find the, those drugs which have the most potential for abuse independence, and no um, medicinal qualities. So here we find heroin, LSD, ecstasy, peyote, and cannabis or marijuana. Uh, this is where THC on the cannabis plant is found. Schedule II drugs are those that have a high potential for abuse independence, but have some medical qualities, such as Vicodin, cocaine, amphetamines, Oxycontin, and Adderall. You will also find THC here as well in a liquid preparation by Syndrus. You'll also find THC in Schedule 3. Uh, these are where you find drugs that have a moderate potential for abuse or dependence and accepted medicinal qualities with the doctor's prescription being required for these. So codeine, ketamine, steroid testosterone, and pure THC known as Marinol. This was FDA approved in 1985 for HIV wasting and chemotherapy and nausea and vomiting. Uh, although it's been approved since 1985, um, the drug does have some unpredictable onset and some side effects, which we'll discuss later on. Oral CBD, known as Epidiolex, sits alone in Schedule 5 as a cannabinoid, approved in 2018. The Office of Medical Marijuana is part of the Delaware Division of Public Health, overseen by Dr. Carol Rete. The mission is to protect Delawareans through proactive monitoring and enforcement of the Delaware Medical Marijuana Act and accompanying regulations. The purpose of this program is to allow the beneficial use of medical marijuana in a regulated system for alleviating symptoms caused by debilitating medical conditions and their medical treatments. So the Office of Medical Marijuana works with the regulated and licensed vendors to ensure safe and effective products are available to Delaware's registered patients as we'll discuss later, this occurs through uh, oversight, such as security cameras and regular testing of the products for potency and purity. The LMM has stringent controls of product inventory to eliminate diversion in the state and the use of medical marijuana products by non-patients. The LMM also briefs the medical community on their protections and limitations involving the medical marijuana program much of which we will discuss in this presentation. The OMM also involves state and local community leaders in discussions pertinent to issues affecting communities. The OMM also closely coordinates with state and local law enforcement on concerns dealing with compassion centers and is responsive to Delaware's registered patients. Delaware's medical marijuana law, Title 16, Chapter 49A, 
was signed into law July 1, 2011. For adult patients, basically all you need to be is a Delaware resident and, have a and be certified by a Delaware licensed physician as having one of the qualifying conditions, but you have to have a bona fide relationship with a certifying physician. Pediatric patients similarly can be a Delaware resident, but they have to also be diagnosed with a qualifying condition and certified by a Delaware licensed pediatric specialist, a neurologist, gastroenterologist, palliative care specialist, psychiatrist, or developmental pediatrician, for example. The qualifying medical conditions include cachexia or wasting syndrome, intractable nausea, muscle spasms, cancer, uh, ALS, terminal illnesses, uh, severe debilitating pain, PTSD, autism, new daily persistent headaches. Um, one of the great things about Delaware's program is right here is that it targets a lot of symptoms of conditions, not the diseases or conditions themselves, which allows for a lot of inclusion in the program for patients. The National Academy of Sciences uh, has some conclusions relevant to Delaware's program. The National Academy of Sciences has stated that there is conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for the treatment of chronic pain in adults and are also effective antiemetics in the treatment of chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, as well as for improving patient reported MS spasticity and symptoms. There is limited evidence that cannabis is ineffective for improving symptoms associated with dementia and improving intraocular pressure associated with glaucoma. And there is a limited amount of evidence of a statistical association between cannabis use and increasing severity of symptoms in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. Pediatric patients have some limitations in terms of what they can access. So their cards are limited access cards. They can only purchase cannabidiol oils, that have at least 15% cannabidiol, but no more than 7% THC or tetrahydrocannabinol. Tetrahydrocannabinol acid, THCA, which is very different from THC, as we'll discuss later, they can purchase products that contain 15% THCA, which is a non-intoxicating product, but no more than 7% THC or tetrahydrocannabinol. The conditions for pediatric patients include terminal illnesses involving pain, anxiety, or depression, related to the terminal illness, seizure disorder, intractable epilepsy, autism with self-injurious or aggressive behavior, chronic or debilitating disease or medical condition where they have failed treatment involving one or more of the following symptoms such as cachexia or wasting syndromes, intractable nausea, severe, painful, and persistent muscle spasms. To cert certifying a patient for a qualifying condition, this happens through a licensed physician in Delaware and they're authorized to certify patients for a qualifying medical condition subject to Chapter 17 or 24. No official registry is required to be able to certify patients. As we'll discuss, it's a form you can fill out online or mail in. Uh, however, presently, physician assistants, nurses, nurse practitioners, chiropractors, licensed clinical social workers, and other health health professionals are not authorized to certify patients for a qualifying medical condition. The physician process for patient certification is very simple. A physician does not need to be certified on a registry like other states. Only patients require certification of a qualifying condition by a physician. The application is available through the MMP website. All that's really needed is a bona fide patient-physician relationship where the patient is and remains under the care of the physician. As, as there is a requirement to assess the patient's medical history and current medical condition. This certification is not a prescription. It simply states that in the physician's professional opinion, the patient is likely to receive therapeutic or palliative benefit from the medical use of cannabis. It's not a prescription. Cannabis or marijuana is a Schedule I drug. No prescriptions are allowed. This is rather a certification of a condition, also known as a recommendation in other states. Presently, Delaware has 470 physicians which are actively certifying patients. There are some limitations to this. The patient-physician relationship 
cannot be limited to medical cannabis certification only. Physicians cannot refer patients to a particular compassion center. They cannot tell them where to get cannabis. Physicians cannot share office space with a compassion center. So uh, you cannot operate your medical practice inside of a dispensary. Patients are protected under the law. Uh, they can possess medical cannabis seeds and stocks. They can give medical cannabis to an active car holder, no compensation allowed. For example, two patients could um, exchange a product uh, as long as there's no other service or something provided there. Or if a patient wants to provide a product that did not work for them to another patient. Um, however, there can be no exchange of services or any sort of monetary exchange. Patients are also protected to have paraphernalia and possess medical cannabis within their six ounce limitation. Paraphernalia includes inhalation devices, pipes, and vaporizers. The approved routes of administration in Delaware are smoking, inhalation, vaporization, sublingual tinctures, uh, as well as topical and oral preparations in the form of capsules. Physicians can provide written certifications to bona fide patients. There are no legal consequences because the physician is not writing a prescription. Also, the physician has the right to refuse to provide certification without recourse, uh, but doesn't release physician from the duty of standard of care of that patient simply because they don't want to certify them for medical cannabis. Additional protections under the law are extended to caregivers. Uh, they can receive compensation for assisting patients with obtaining and administering cannabis. Uh, so if the patient has mobility issues, a family member can assist them or a third party potentially. Any person may sell cannabis paraphernalia to an active card holder or a registered or licensed facility or operation in the state of Delaware. So pipes and vaporizers or rolling papers, for example. Um, any person can also be in the presence of medical cannabis uh, as the law allows, and we'll get into some caveats there, um, and can insist a registered patient with medical cannabis use. Compassion centers and their agents or staff can sell or transfer seeds to licensed entities in other jurisdictions. Um, their property can have appropriate signage, and they may have listings in business directories, phone books, and trade or medical publications. And they may sponsor health or not-for-profit charity or advocacy. Some of the limitations about possessing um, cannabis under the law, one of the big limitations is uh, on a school bus or on school grounds, except as authorized for pediatric use. Um, it's not allowed in any correctional facility or in any healthcare or treatment facility operated by or funded contractually through the DHSS. If the person possessing it doesn't have an active MMP card with them, they are not allowed to possess cannabis. If you have cannabis, have your MMP card with you. Smoking or using cannabis is not allowed in any form of transportation or in any public place if the smoker does not have a serious or debilitating medical condition. If the user or smoker does not have an active MMP card, they are not allowed to use it as well. Also, typical of other medications, operating, navigating, or being in actual physical control of any motor vehicle, aircraft, or motorboat is uh, not protected under this law, as well as undertaking any task when doing so would constitute negligence or professional malpractice. Patients assume responsibility for using cannabis as a medicinal therapy as they would with any other medication. Uh, possession limits for patients in this program include up to six ounces at any one time and may purchase up to three ounces every 14 days from a Delaware Compassion Center. This applies to both flowers and concentrated products, but they must carry their card with them if they are carrying medical cannabis. Compassion centers are located throughout Delaware in four locations, Newcastle, Kent, and Sussex. These centers are actively monitored with a video feed and customer feedback. There's a BioTrack seed to sale software that allows Compassion Centers statewide to track how much patients are buying. So there is no worry about patients going over their limit 
uh, because the system is all in a central location for the data. There is also a licensed laboratory for the state, which acts as a guardian to public health, making sure the products meet certain quality assurance standards and product safety standards, such as you know, bacteria, fungus, mold, and pesticide testing, as well as potency and purity testing. To obtain a medical cannabis card, the patient has to meet with the physician to obtain the certification, and it's good for 90 days once signed. Complete the patient application online or a printed copy, pay the application fee, upload a copy or mail co a copy of the Delaware issued driver's license or state issued ID. And then there is a renewal process. The card is valid for one year, but may submit for renewal 90 days prior to the exp expiration date. And this process can also be completed online or mailed to the department. When patients visit a dispensary, these are very secure facilities. To enter the building, there are security measures and they are monitored internally and externally with cameras. Trained staff is available inside to discuss the patient's needs, such as routes of administration, different formulations, their costs, and other issues. Payment is typically cash or debit card. As of July 2019, these are the adult and patient and physician demographics. We see um, that most of the patients in this program are 45 or over. It's roughly evenly split between male and female, largely reside in Newcastle County. Um, and the top two conditions for adults include severe debilitating pain and symptoms of PTSD. For the pediatric population, it's largely male, uh, with the primary um, condition are seizure disorders or severe debilitating autism and most of the physicians who certify reside in Newcastle County. And now we move on to what we all came here to learn about, the cannabis plant. So the cannabis plant is used for a number of things. When we talk about medical cannabis products, we're talking about a very particular part of the plant that is used. In this image on the right, we can see a cannabis plant with some blue arrows pointing to different parts of it. The leaves, stems, and stalks, and roots um, do not have a lot of cannabinoids on them. It is the unfertilized flowering tops of the cannabis that are targeted for extraction and processing to manufacture medical cannabis products. It is because the flowering tops have trichomes on them. The plant uses these for reproduction and defense. We use them to extract medically useful products. Um, seeds, sprouts, Fertilized female flower tops have very typically lower amounts of cannabis. Uh, fertilized female flower tops with seeds typically have about half the potency of an unfertilized flower. Seeds, stems, and roots have virtually no cannabinoids on them. If you do find THC or CBD on seeds or seed sprouts, it's there through contamination, not because they produce them. Cannabinoids. There are an enormous amount of plant cannabinoids that have been reported on the cannabis plant. It's a virtual alphabet soup. Um, these can cannabinoids found on the cannabis plant are typically fat-like with low water solubility, which made them difficult to isolate or extract in the early days of Victorian chemists. Other drugs like morphine and cocaine are water soluble, cannabinoids are not. The four most popular cannabinoids are THC, THC acid, CBD, and CBN. THCA, or tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, is the primary metabolite produced by the cannabis plant. This is how THC acid is what's made on the plant. THC is an artifact or product that's created through heat and storage. And we'll discuss decarboxylation in a little bit, the process of which THCA converts to THC. Cannabinol, or CBN, is the degradation product of THC. It is a tertiary product from the cannabis plant. It is about half as potent as THC. Cannabidiol is a non-intoxicating product of the cannabis plant, which we will spend some time talking about later on, but it is also one of the most abundant products found in the plant. So why does cannabis have an effect on the human body? 
it is because we all have an endocannabinoid system. In fact, all mammals have this system. It's one of the most abundant systems in the mammalian body. Now, this is a system which provides a biological balancing act to help regulate physiological processes, including appetite, pain, and pleasure sensations, immune system, mood, and memory. The endocannabinoids are derived from arachidonic acid in the body, and they are ligands or targets for cannabinoid receptors. Essentially, they're fatty acid signaling molecules that are synthesized on demand and signal through a retrograde action. The cannabis plant produces phytocannabinoids, which act similarly to the body's endocannabinoids. So we have three flavors of cannabinoids. We have the endocannabinoids produced by the body, we have the phytocannabinoids produced by the plant, and we have synthetic cannabinoids produced in a laboratory. THC and CBD are primarily produced in nature. They can be synthesized, um, but they basically mimic the effects of endocannabinoids to regulate biological responses and provide symptom relief. THC directly stimulates these receptors while CBD acts indirectly. CBD elevates the levels of endocannabinoids, such as anandamide and 2-AG, by inhibiting their degradation. THC also increases the activity of other receptors, such as 5-HT1A and adenosine receptors. There are two main receptors for the endocannabinoid system, CB1 and CB2. There are other candidate receptors, but we'll focus on the two well, most well studied here. They are members of the G protein coupled receptor family, the class A rhodopsin family. It is a super family of receptors. CB1 receptors are found throughout the central nervous system. They're one of the most abundant proteins in the human brain. You'll find them all over the motor system, uh, the motor cortex, the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, in motor neurons in the spinal cord. You also find them in the eye, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, testes, and ovaries. Their wide distribution makes them great therapeutic targets. However, CB1 receptors are the target of THC, which cause intoxication. These, are, these receptors are not found in the brain stem, uh, in the mandula oblongata. So they do not control respiration or influence respiration, unlike opioids. This is one of the reasons why a lethal toxic overdose of cannabis has never been reported, is due to the sparse location of these receptors in the brainstem. CB2 receptors, the type 2 receptor, is sometimes referred to as the peripheral receptor or their immune receptor for cannabinoids. CB2 receptors are primarily found in the immune system, such as the bone marrow, thymus, spleen, and tonsils, also in the uterus, lungs, bone, microglia, and in brainstem neurons, as well as in microglial cells. Stimulation of CB2 receptors does not result in intoxication. It is largely associated with anti-inflammatory activities. So activation of CB1 results in the inhibition of neurotransmitter release, notably in an inhibition of glutamate. So you have a hyperpolarization of membrane potential in pre- and postsynaptic neurons, which results in the inhibition of glutamate release, for example. And again, just as a reminder, there are very few cannabinoid receptors in the brainstem, which is part of why a lethal toxic overdose for cannabis has never been reported. Decarboxylation is something that'll come up whenever you talk about cannabis. It's the process by which THCA, uh, the naturally occurring primary metabolite in cannabis, um, is converted to THC essentially by heating up the plant. This is important when producing products uh, such as pills or tinctures because THCA will not stimulate cannabinoid receptors like THC will. So this can occur through combustion when it's heated beyond 451 degrees Fahrenheit and inhaled. Also through vaporization, it can be decarboxylated. Products, as we will discuss, typically decarboxylate or decarb the THC acid to THC when making preparations. Um, different cannabinoids and terpenes have different points of activation or vaporization 
So vaporization at different levels will produce different flavors and potentially different effects from the other active ingredients known as terpenes on the cannabis plant. Terpenes are the flavor and smell compounds related to the cannabis plant. THC, CBD do not have a smell. Terpenes are responsible for the unique odor and fragrance of cannabis plant. Um, they're produced at the same sites as cannabinoids at the trichomes. They vary in concentration depending on environmental factors, genetics. Um, over a hundred have been identified on the cannabis plant. Terpenes plus cannabinoids is theorized to cause what's called an entourage effect. Um, so consuming the whole plant conceptually is more effective than the purified compounds for a couple of reasons. Research has shown that compared to pure THC, a THC CBD extract with the full complement of terpenes and other compounds is more effective at reducing um, cancer pain and other conditions. So a couple of terpenes found on cannabis plant include pinene, which is a bronchial dilator as well as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and it is thought that high amounts of pinene in cannabis can counteract the intoxicating properties of THC. Similarly, linalool and limonene have anti-anxiety properties, uh, as shown in animal and human studies of these terpenes. They are thought to counteract some of the anxiety-causing effects of cannabis as well. So terpenes can reduce the side effects of cannabis, um, and this has been a strategy that pharmaceutical companies and cannabis operators have been leveraging. So, just to review, THC is the main psychoactive compound in the cannabis pen. It produces the high feeling. It binds directly with cannabinoid receptors. Low THC and high CBD varieties of cannabis provide a medical effect and therapeutic value without psychoactive or intoxicating properties. CBD does go into the brain and interact with receptors but it is non-intoxicating, non-euphoric. It indirectly stimulates cannabinoid receptors. There is some information out there you might see about it being converted to THC in the stomach. This is not at a physiologically relevant process. And again, remember, purified CBD is available as epidiolex, and these studies have been conducted on looking at its effect in stomach conversion. Regarding symptom relief, THC has been shown in human studies to reduce nerve-related pain. To provide mild to moderate relief, um, not quite where opiates are, but stronger than aspirin. It can be, have a relaxing effect, um, partially due to anti-inflammatory properties. Probably its most well-known effect is appetite stimulation. Um, it can, it's also reported to reduce daytime fatigue improve night sleep. THC is also an antiemetic. For example, Marinol, a Schedule III drug, can be prescribed for cancer-induced nausea and vomiting. Cannabidiol, or CBD, has been shown in animal studies to reduce neuropathic pain. It's also been shown to be, have strong anti-inflammatory properties. There is also gathering evidence that it has anti-anxiety and anti-psychotic properties. It can also have some antispasm effects without the lethargy or, or dysphoria. It also can relieve some of the cytotoxic properties from chemotherapy. Regarding formulations of cannabis, those include the flower, which is the female flowering part of the cannabis plant that produces the cannabinoids such as THC and CBD. This is usually ground down and vaporized or smoked or infused into oils and butters to prepare edibles with. There is shake, which is typically finely ground cannabis flowers or fan leaves. Um, there are pre-rolls, which are uh, cannabis flowers that are homogenized, ground up, and rolled into a cigarette form, similar to what the University of Mississippi provides for clinical trials. Concentrated oils are also available. Cannabinoids are extracted and refined from the cannabis plant, from the flowers, targeting the trichome, which produces a more purified and potent form. These extracts also contain terpenes as well. And this can be smoked, vaporized, used in edibles, or applied directly to the mouth as a tincture. 
topical formulations, lotions, ointment, balms, and creams are great for local application of specific areas to the body, such as for arthritis or pain. Uh, these, unless there is a cut or open wound, these should not cause intoxication or impairment. Uh, sublingual tinctures is absorbed buccally or under the tongue, which leads to quick and clean option. Uh, sublingual products should not be swallowed. They should be, again, absorbed through the tongue. Capsules, these are, you know, swallowed by the mouth, orally administered similar to other medications. Um, dosing orally with cannabinoids can be tricky. They do have a low bioavailability when administered orally, and the onset can take a while, anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. Vaporization is the process of heating the cannabis plant at a specific temperature under which the point of combustion without burning the plant material. So these products that I'm talking about are all available in the state of Delaware. So there are some differences about how these products interact with the human body, their onset, their potency, and things like that. The standard dosing guideline is start low, go slow, stay low. Start low, go slow, stay low. So the most popular form of, con of consuming cannabis is smoking. This is a rapid onset, five to 10 minutes, and, can, and the effects of which can last two to four hours. This has some advantages. It's quick, it's good for acute or episodic symptoms, such as a flare-up of intraocular pressure or a flare-up of muscle spasms. Smoking, again, no one should probably be smoking because of the respiratory effects. Um, but again, there's technical skills required for rolling cannabis products or using um, uh, inhalation devices. 30 to 50% of cannabis is also lost to side stream smoke. So smoking's incredibly a wasteful way to use this product, but this is approved for flour, shake, pre-roll, and concentrated oil. Vaporization uh, is very similar to smoking in terms of onset duration. Um, it does have some advantages. It is less smelly than smoking. There are fewer respiratory effects and much healthier than smoking. There are some more expensive upfront costs associated with vaporizers, and again, usually requires electrical power source or, or charging. And you can vaporize flour, shake, and concentrated oils. Oral or edible capsules, these can take one to two hours to kick in, um, and typically can last upwards of six to eight hours. There are some advantages, you know, there's no odor, they're discreet, the effects last a long time, there's no effects on the lung, um, and there can be more precise dosing with capsules. Um, and they, again, can be really good for chronic disease and symptoms because of the long duration. Typically, you can, to get an effect, you can consume much lower amounts orally than you would need if you're inhaling it. However, oral administration of cannabinoids is a bit unpredictable with the onset and duration, um, and it's less precise dosing for edibles. And so additional time may be needed to prepare and bake these edibles as well. However, um, oral edible preparations are made from flour, shake, and, and capsules. Tinctures are similar to smoking and, or vaporization in terms of onset, 10 to 15 minutes. These can last two to six hours. Typically, tinctures are administered under the tongue, and absorbed buccally, and can avoid the first round pass of metabolism in the liver. Unlike oral preparation, which goes through that first round pass, smoking, vaporization, and tinctures avoid the first round pass by the liver, but they are eventually processed by the liver. Um, these are discrete and can be precise measured dosing with a metered dropper. They are alcohol-based and the taste may be unpleasant. Those are some disadvantages. And again, these are available um, as approved route administration in Delaware. Topicals, these are highly variable in their onset and duration, but there are no psychoactive effects and they're good for localized symptoms. Um, disadvantages is that some of these creams and lotions can be quite smelly um, and there can be a little greasiness on the skin and it only provides relief for localized symptoms. So as a general guide to picking a ratio, based on data and research from licensed operators here, um, for things like inflammation, anxiety, seizures, muscle spasms, especially when it comes to someone who's prone to anxiety, 
you want to stay away from high THC products. You want to look at something low THC, high CBD to start. Typically, the best place to start is a one-to-one -one ratio. With an equal amount of THC and CBD, uh, it will cancel out the intoxicating properties of THC. CBD has this wonderful ability to put a ceiling or balance out the intoxicating properties of THC. It's a strategy that's been used, again, by pharmaceutical companies to create cannabis products. Uh, and this one-to-one -one ratio has been studied in randomized controlled trials, looking at muscle spasms, uh, chronic pain, inflammation, seizures, nausea, sleep, and loss of appetite. However, for severe muscle spasms, nausea, severe sleep issues, especially loss of appetite, chronic pain, and cancer-induced nausea and vomiting, high THC, low CBD seems to be effective. There are side effects related to THC-rich products. Some of the more common physiological side effects include sleepiness or drowsiness, sometimes dizziness, dry mouth, sometimes nausea, stomach pain, um, vomiting can occur, there can be headaches or coughs. Um, but uh, there are other rarer things that have been reported, such as diarrhea, orthostatic hypertension, tachycardia, which is typically short-term, as well as cannabis hyperemesis, which is a cyclical vomiting syndrome. These, again, are very rare. The most common ones are sleepy, drowsiness, dizziness, and, and dry mouth, for sure. Um, there, are, there have been some psychomotor effects reported with high THC products, such as blurred vision and slowed reaction time, but ataxia and discoordination is very rarely reported. In terms of cognition, cannabis intoxication from THC may cause anxiety in some patients, and euphoria. Those are very common side effects, especially for naive users, first-time users. Um, what's very rare is depression. So we have here very common and rare side effects for THC-rich products. You can read more about this on the department's website. They have some information there, as well as um, I'd potentially recommend reading about Marinol. It's an FDA-approved drug and has similar side effect profile. Cannabis use is associated with schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, we have to remember that this is an association. It is a factor in these conditions. It does not cause psychosis. It does not cause schizophrenia. These are associations or factors in these diseases. Cannabis use disorder can develop as a result of using cannabis chronically, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. But some side effects are also therapeutic effects. Sleepiness or drowsiness might be something a patient is looking for to help them sleep, um, just as an example. So cannabis use disorder, or CUD as it's affectionately called, um, has an 11 point scale. And basically you can walk through this with a patient and two to three means they have mild symptoms of a cannabis use disorder. Seven or more, it's severe, moderate, four to six. So some of these include, you know, using cannabis in larger amounts for longer than intended, spending excessive time in acquisition using or recovering from use, cravings and urges to use cannabis, um, recurrent use in hazardous situation, using despite negative effects, needing more cannabis to attain the desired effects, which is developing tolerance, um, the development of any withdrawal symptoms, um, which are relieved by taking more of the substance, and for failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. These are all potential symptoms of cannabis use disorder. Moderate to severe anxiety is another contraindication, especially with high THC products, active unstable heart disease, Allergy to cannabis or any of its components is another obvious contraindication. And pregnancy and breastfeeding is another area where we urge people not to use cannabis. The National Academy of Sciences had concluded for contraindications related to cannabis that there was evidence of a statistical relationship between cannabis use and the development of schizophrenia or other psychoses, with the highest risk among frequent users. However, substantial evidence of a statistical association between paternal cannabis use and lower birth weight of offspring has also been reported. And there is a moderate evidence of a statistical association between regular cannabis use 
in increased systems of mania, hypomania in individuals diagnosed with bipolar disorder, as well as increased incidence of social anxiety disorder. However, there is insufficient evidence to support or refute the conclusion that cannabidiol is an effective treatment for mental health outcomes in individuals with schizophrenia or schizophrenic psychosis, but this is a promising area of research. So, so cannabis use is not a guaranteed risk-free endeavor. Um, but again, we have to remember that these are associations and factors that contribute to these conditions. Um, and there are levels of which to assess the strength of the evidence for these conditions as well as uh, cannabis use disorder factors. There can be some drug-drug interactions with cannabis. Um, CBD, for example, is metabolized by the same cytochrome P450 enzymes as half of the prescription medications out there. So there is a potential risk of drug-drug interactions, either changing the kinetics of the cannabinoids or the kinetics of the prescription drug. So when THC or CBD or a combination is taken orally and goes through a first pass of the liver, there is a potential for enhanced CNS depressant effects when taken with barbiturates or benzodiazepine, alcohol, and some antidepressants. Um, clobazam, a sedative used to treat seizure disorders, is affected by CBD in some studies where it can elevate the levels of that drug in the blood. Cannabis may also impact blood sugar, which is something that uh, diabetics should be perceived with caution when using cannabis. And vasodilation from cannabinoids may exacerbate hemophilia. And there's also contraindication with certain behavioral health conditions, as discussed earlier. The cytochrome P450 enzymes are a class of drug metabolizing enzymes. Um, and cannabis interacts with the cytochrome P450 family. There are a huge variety of these compounds. Again, they're expressed mostly in the GI tract and the liver. They affect drug bioavailability and drug clearance. And you get two copies of SIPs from, you know, your mother and father, and you might get a good copy, you might get a bad copy, and that will affect how you metabolize drugs. Some people are ultra-rapid metabolizers of drugs. They take high amounts, and it's rapidly cleared through the system. Other people are slow metabolizers of drugs, and most of the population is, is right in the middle. So SIP activity, that is the SIP P450 enzyme, activity can vary tenfold between individuals, primarily due to drug interactions and genetics. For future directions, um, the program looks to serve patients to the best of the program's ability, enhance provider access to cannabis education resources, improve and refine the scope of the policy, as well as expand the availability of and type of product. The state of Delaware's medical marijuana program hopes to have edibles available soon. There is pending legislation regarding adult use of cannabis a compassion care card versus a medical card, as well as allowing physician assistants and nurse practitioners to become authorized to certify patients for a qualifying medical condition. Be sure to check for updates on this on the department's website. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. I'd like to thank Alexa Meinhart for her hard work in putting this presentation together, as well as a whole host of people that deserve acknowledgement for their work in making this presentation possible. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments at my email address, jmarku at ircmh.org. Feel free to send me your questions or comments. I'd be happy to do my best to answer them or send you additional resources. That's a very good question. Um, it depends on the product. Um, there are some cases that have been reported in the news where that has happened, where people took a CBD product from an unlicensed operator and they failed a drug test. So um, operators who are not licensed by the state 
you know, don't, don't necessarily, you know, they might not be getting the products tested, but dispensary operators here, all their CBD products are tested. So you know if there's THC in them or significant amounts of it. Right, but I thought you can go anywhere and get CBD oil. In other words, you don't have to have a license to get CBD so, oil. Uh, right? So the FDA, so uh, we published a study in JAMA um, looking at those products that you could buy online and everywhere, and 70% of them were, did not match the label. Some of them had nothing in them. So uh, I would not recommend buying products from a gas station um, just because they could be counterfeit products, they are not required to be tested. They could be something else entirely. I, I, again, I highly recommend that they become a certified patient and obtain it legally. Um, because you do not know what is in that street product. The, those products are not bound by the regulations in Delaware. Yeah, the law is pretty clear that there that you, you as a physician will not be in violation of any law. You are protected if you decide not now or ever to, you know, certify patients for marijuana for medical marijuana. You are protected. So, but don't I have to refer at some point? Even if I don't want to prescribe, no different than if the standard of care was perform an abortion, and I don't do that. I may still have to make that referral to someone who does. Where are we doing the standard of care with this? It, it, it's really hard to imagine that's, uh, that that's going to change in our lifetime. I mean, in part because it's a Schedule One drug that doesn't have the level of research that, you know, most of what, how we establish standards of care, we just don't have that level of research right now. So I, I would not say that's a risk. Maybe 100 years from now that will look different. Um, so there are a lot of observational studies in that work, and I could send you some more papers. Um, the, much like a lot of evidence about cannabis in some of these areas, it is sparse and contradictory. Um, but when it comes to the effect in a clinical setting on measuring cognition, the effects of cannabis um, abate with abstinence. So the effects of THC that someone might have on cognition, um, there has not been any reliable, predictable measures of detriment. Um, heavy adolescent use, yes, there seems to be um, some areas uh, that are affected, but generally the effects on cognition in the brain abate with um, abstinence. And as a Pope study, they looked at um, users who started when they were teenagers through adults. Um, some had been using for as long as 20 years battery of cognitive exams. There's also a great report um, recently out. Um, I actually just, I don't want to talk too much, but I wrote a, I just ha have an article submitted on that subject, so I'm happy to share it with you. Research um, from um, by Ziva Cooper and colleagues. She's also one of the authors of the National Academy of Sciences report. They have co-administered um, opiates and cannabis in a laboratory setting. They found that the cannabis did not uh, increase the abuse liability of the opioids medication during the t the window that they looked at. So, and CBD has also been shown to be uh, not affect things like fentanyl. Um, in human populations. I know it's kind of a rare prescription or treatment, but there is human data showing that CBD does not interact or affect um, the kinetics related to fentanyl. Or it's a it's online just a letter. It's an online form that you'll have to fill out. Okay. And, yeah, it um, just authorizes. Okay. Yeah, I just, yeah, yeah.
chronic adolescent youth is tied to poor, poor academic achievement. But, you know, a lot of those studies have limitations to how we can apply them. It is concern when anyone is using a substance, like, chronically. Uh, so, again, I, look at the meta-analyses on that report because there are vulnerable populations, but again, a lot of the symptoms abate with abstinence. Yeah. Well, to get to the point of that blood test, you'd first have to fail the roadside sobriety impairment test. So you'd already be impaired. It wouldn't really matter what you were on. And, and that's, again, that's like, I mean, yeah. So you'd have to first, again, fail the roadside sobriety test before they administered a breathalyzer and then did the blood test. But And in Delaware, we're, we're an impairment state. So if you were on cough syrup or... Um, an opiate or a benzo and you were stopped in your vehicle because you were impaired to driving, it's the same charge. It's driving while impaired. Okay. Well, it's really going to depend on a number of factors. One, how much the patient uh, consumes to get their therapeutic balance. Uh, what products they choose to ingest it. There are some that are just naturally cheaper. There are some strains that are easier to grow and more prevalent, so obviously they're going to be a little cheaper. But essentially, right now, all of the flower products are about the same price at all three dispensaries. Sometimes, well, there's four locations you can currently purchase, but there's three vendors. And actually, the vendors are here. There's a First State, want to wave? Uh, there's Fresh or CCRI, and over here is Columbia Care. But are they competitive or they set the prices? They set their own prices. When we did the request for proposals, they had a maximum and a minimum price range that they had to stay within. They all have always stayed within those uh, envelopes. And are they comparable nationwide? Or they... We're a little bit more uh, here in Delaware mm -hmm. than some places. We're a little cheaper than others. Uh, because we have a large testing program, uh, it costs a lot of money to run all those tests. And every batch of marijuana is tested for, uh, like as Jayanne was saying, for uh, safety, uh, profile for the cannabinoids, uh, for pesticides, things like that. So it's a, it's a rather expensive process. And coverage other than pediatric epilepsy or uh, anti-emetic effects in terms of insurances? Unfortunately, no. the law does not require insurance companies to pay for this. At some point, maybe it will, uh, but... But at this point, none do? No. Uh, okay. Uh, did that come from the dictionary of hardest questions about cannabis? Um, so to answer the second one, um, there's a lot of differences between adult use cannabis and medical cannabis programs. Uh, when Nevada went adult use, um, they sold out of products. First come, first serve to the adult use buyers, nothing left for the medical cannabis program there. So patients without cannabis for weeks. Um, so medical programs are actually needed to guarantee supply for people who need it for conditions. The second thing is that certain products will never be used recreationally and I'll give you a 10 to 1 bet that cannabis suppositories will never be used significantly recreationally but yet are in demand in the medical population. Where did vaporizers come from? It came from HIV, AIDS, and cancer patients who could not smoke things because it was too irritating and disruptive to their treatments. So a lot of the products developed in the market came out of medical need or desire. So there will be a need for this product medically. Also in the future of getting it covered by insurance, um, some patients have already had their vaporizers covered by their insurance program. So I think that there will be a need. Also, a typical healthy adult doesn't need to worry about certain contaminants. You know, I ate an apple today that probably had aspergillus on it, right? 
So uh, you go to the grocery store, that's what you're getting, right? So there are certain standards that are needed. I'll give you, I'll give you a quick analogy with garlic. You can buy garlic bulk wholesale. You get to know where it's grown, whether or not it's organic, right? You can also buy it crushed up as a spice. You get a little more information there. You can buy it as an encapsulated form as a supplement, but that requires a lot of testing, documentation, and some sort of additional rounds of research, right? You can also get it in a purified FDA form, a single agent on prescription to treat a certain condition. So garlic's available in all four forms, why do we need garlic as a supplement and a medical product if we have it in the grocery store? Right? So that would answer, the, I think, that question a little bit about why we need the medical programs versus, you know, just going all adult use. Yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about your patient population to really make an observation, but the important part is that they didn't start there. Um, but I think it might be worth looking um, at why they're using it. Um, uh, you know, and I think that perhaps double checking some things. But, um, you know, see what they say if you want to administer a cannabis use disorder survey. I don't know. I mean, it really, it's, it could be due to their severity of the condition. I mean, if you specialize in chronic, severe, debilitating pain, um, that could be a reason. I mean, I don't know if they all have the same condition or not. So, uh, and, um, But um, the flip side of that is there are conditions like specifically anxiety that people have, you know, there's been a constant push for uh, medical marijuana. And I think, as you all know, once you certify, you, you don't really have a lot of control over what they get. So we did, we have worked with legislators and, and um, there is a piece of legislation out there that might enable um, other um, conditions like anxiety to be used um, for medical marijuana, but it would only be the high CBD form, low THC. That also opens the door then for you to be able to say to a patient that um, you want them to only receive the high CBD, low THC formulation as well for maybe they have some other condition. So it, that, is, um, that will open the door to give you a little bit of flexibility to say, I don't want you on high THC products. No, it, you wouldn't be picking in general what strain they're getting, but you could say that this is a patient that you want on a, um, a high CBD, low THC um, formulation. It's a, little, it's, it's a little different. The uh, doctor-patient relationship, the way we define it is um, a re an expect expectation of a recurring relationship with a doctor where the physician has established a medical record and uh, is following the patient's progress. So uh, that, that relationship has to start at some point. So the first event that you see a, a patient, you may decide you wanna certify that patient. My office is gonna require some additional information from a previous physician basically stating that this patient has had, well, let's use pain for an example, this patient's been treated for pain for a period of time and now that you're in charge of his care for this um, you know you're willing to uh, to certify him that's it's so it's funny you mentioned that I'm actually I'm working on a NIDA grant to actually create a database for cannabis products um, so they, they are interested in creating a database like that but not quite as you're saying but there is a need, there is a, yeah, that is like something NIDA is actually looking at funding, is the creation of that type of database. Well, we have 11 experiments where we can look at adult use and medical programs existing side by side, and there's a lot of lessons they've learned there, but I mean, Washington State is like 30, in the last couple of years, 30,000 patients register into their program, despite it being adult use, and anyone can walk in, 
to a place and buy a product. Um, and again, I'm going to circle back to product safety standards for products that are labeled for therapy and medical. Um, there's been a study done like in Washington State where you walk in and buy the products for adult use. They have pesticides and other stuff in them that are not found in products that are for medical use. It seems really weird, but it also to the point of the recommendation, um, I give another presentation on the history of regulations, and this has come through case law, why the recommendation exists, um, and, and why has that come to be. But it, it's a recommendation started off as just saying, I do not object to my patient using cannabis. Um, and so it hasn't gotten to the point to prescriptions because there are no FDA approved products right now through this program that you can <laughs> access. It's a long way, I think it's inevitable, but it's still a long ways away. But, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the FDA does have a botanical drug process, but only two drugs have ever been approved. One is the garlic and one is the compound from cranberries. Um, so it's, it's, there's only been ever two botanical substances. The last extract to fail in the botanical drug process in the FDA was a carrot extract. Um, it's too complicated for them to analyze. It's like 60 different beta carotenes and stuff like that. So they're actually kind of retooling that. And that's why they did the public hearing about CBD is they're trying to set up working groups to set up those pathways to get these products approved for markets. Um, so I think that's trying to be sussed out right now. Again, we're talking about a history uh, like a patchwork of regulations, some dereliction of responsibility in terms of regulating this effectively in other states. But again, um, I think that, uh, again, it's still the patient's responsibility. They accept responsibility for using these products. Dispensaries also do a good job of educating patients. I have heard from more than one dispensary operator that if they see a patient is using a lot of THC products, like the highest ones, they voluntarily like say, you know, intervene and, and talk to them about like, we've noticed you've been buying only THC rich products, what's up here? Um, and I've heard this in other states, like all over, that people are taking a more active role. They're hiring PharmDs to talk to patients about these issues. So it's not just like some, you know, uh, person there behind the counter may not have a medical background. You're getting medical professionals involved with education and training and discussions with these patients to address some of the issues you're having or, or you know, that you're thinking about. There are, dis medical cannabis operations are interested in these people being healthy, not just buying as many products as possible, finding what works to them with the least amount of side effects. Because, um, you know, if a patient has a bad experience with a product, that's also bad for them. Um, so I think, you know, when you think about it, dispensaries and medical cannabis operators are a lot more active than they have been in the past, especially all the newer companies at nipping those sort of things in the bud. So, um, pardon the pun, but, um, you know, so we can talk more about it later, and I'm sure the dispensary operators here can kind of talk to you as well as Paul about some of these issues with regards to that. But um, I hope that kind of answers your question. <laughs> it, it's, so is that, well, so CBD products that are sold through dispensaries here have to be tested by the lab because we don't we don't know what's on the products in the internet. Like most. No, of no, the I get that, but for patient safety, why does a doctor have to get involved? If the person's already on CBD oil and they don't know what's in it, why can't they just walk into? Because it's also a schedule. It's it's DEA code is seven three seven two. It's a schedule one drug unless obtained through a licensed operator under the hemp farm bill. CBD has never been legal in all 50 states. It's a Schedule One drug. I've worked under DEA licenses. But you're able to get it in a local store. Yeah, you, you can, can buy... Well, the, the, the formulations yeah. available here have some THC in them. In, in New York State, they've banned the products. Food Health Department has shown up, confiscated products, fined operators, and shut them down for selling CBD products without a license. So just because it's allowed doesn't mean it's legal. You know what I mean? It's just, this is not enforced. Yeah. Walk into Walgreens, Rite Aid. And they're only selling lotions, cosmetic no, they're products. They're selling creams. They're 
Well, you don't eat creams. You don't, you know what I mean? They're not so oh, I know they could be selling oils. No, but they're not. Look at those agreements. But that's the says they're selling. Yes, they're selling oils nationally. They advertise it on their website. Show me a test that shows what's in them. I mean, no, no, we all agree. I'm well, just no, saying. If it's safer for the patients, why do they need to get? Because okay, so those currently laws, the way our law is yeah. constructed, you have to have a card to enter a restricted no, building. Oh, so yeah. it, it, if there is, I can see in the future, maybe a, an ability for a patient to access a non-secure part of the facility and make those purchases. I see that in, in, in our future. It's just not today's reality. Yeah, the FDA has been clear about their stance on it. So regarding that, um, for CBD that's on the market right now, it has to be 0.3% or less of THC. That's why you can go into the store and get it. At the dispensary, it is a full spectrum plant, so it does have THC in it, which is still illegal. So that would be the difference. That's why you can go into a Walgreens and not come into a dispensary. Okay, so there's nothing that's 100% just CBD. Exactly, exactly. And it's, so and it's quite true. frankly, and Jayhan can talk more about this, it's more effective if it has some THC in it. And, you know, and a lot of the products, again, that are not through licensed operators have little to no THC or CBD, sorry, CBD in them. We published the data on this. Uh, the Clean Label Project, we just analyzed another bunch of products for like 500 different things. I mean, the results are frightening from these products that are not available through licensed producers. I, it is really, I'm just, I can't. But, but the people in this room, we're not the ones that are telling them I to know. go to the store. They're coming to our offices and telling us they've already been there. Right. And, and I agree completely with what the gentleman said there. You shouldn't advise patients to get products from a licensed operator where you have some semblance of product safety. Again. I've seen where these products come from in five years. I stopped doing cannabis operation inspections internationally because of uh, how gross the CBD products were. In Europe, the problem's even worse. They fail for polyaromatic hydrocarbons beyond any legal limit. Some of the most disgusting products I've seen have been CBD products that are sold without a license. I cannot emphasize that enough. So when you think about stuff used for cosmetics, and in bath bombs, that's one thing. But inhaled products and edible products, we've purchased them, we've tested them, not only in single labs, but in two separate labs with internationally accredited methods. I can't emphasize that enough that, yes, people are buying something labeled as CBD. I mean, it, it, they're placebo products, maybe. Like, I mean, it's, yeah. Because we'll get sued if we do that. Yeah, so I'm already <laughs> off the record. Yeah, they will come after you. Like, yeah, so you can't publish the names of the company because they will come after you because we really live in a litigious society. But I think the farm D in the room that works at the cannabis operation would think that she's offering decent advice to patients. Well, there, we do know how THC and CBD are metabolized. THC has been approved by the FDA since 1985. They had to do those contraindication studies. There is evidence coming out like every week about a further identifying drug-drug interactions. Um, but again, some of this research is difficult to do. But yes, there, we do see blood levels changing for certain drugs and certain classes that go through SIPs. So if you want to give me a list of drugs, like you can go to Navigator Genomics or any of the other dozens of white label genetic company testing. I think there's another one in New York. I can't remember the name. Like they do that. Like that's part of the reason I am interested. You're in saying that I can that there's a, a website I can go to and put in medical marijuana, an THC, SSR, an, an SSR, you know, and, and, and half a dozen other common drugs, mm -hmm. an SSRI, a, a Benzo, yeah. whatever, and it's going to tell me what the interactions are for my patient. It's going to tell you if there can be an interaction. Yes. Because I can't do that for non-medical marijuana. So I'm fascinated THC, that you CBD, can do with medical marijuana. CBD. There are databases out there that you can access. Yeah, I am happy. My email's up there. Happy to sh share that reporting structure with you. Yeah.
that's being used in clinical studies right now to predict who will respond either poorly or positively to cannabis. But yeah, it's, it's, that is part of the research. In like personalized medicine at Penn, they're interested in this as well. So there are tools to study it. Okay, but, so we're doing gene testing on, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue, but we're doing right. gene testing on patients now, which makes certain predictions. There's a lot of problems with it, it's failing a lot of things, and some of the biggest gene companies out there have recently, in psychiatry at least, had to revoke certain tests that they're running because they turned out to be lies. And there's a difference between a genetic prediction of what might happen and true known drug interactions. Yeah, so I think it's MedWatch has a fairly comprehensive list of those drug-drug interactions. So um, I'm, again, I'm happy to send you the link. Um, that data is out there. It's just not all, in, it's not collated conveniently in one place. So like for the last 20 years, it's been a trial and error period for people who get recommendations to use cannabis. And to narrow that trial and error window is a lot of reasons why dispensaries and operators have voluntarily hired PharmDs, is to assist with that process. Because it is a trial and error approach. Um, and reducing that and also discussing current medications and things like that has also been a goal. So like New York, Pennsylvania, five states require PharmDs to be on site to advise patients.